Brexit has revitalised debates about democracy. Restoring democracy and sovereignty can come with risks for those strongly committed to free markets. Our fellow citizens might even choose another path, perhaps one that could lead to socialist and freedom-hindering policies. But is that a risk we must take? In a free society, what individual rights should never be infringed on? What should be voted on? And is there a place for technocratic decision-making? In a new paper, the director of the IEA's Freer Initiative, Rebecca Lowe, argues that one clear answer to improving democracy here in the UK would be to institute a proper focus on local decision-making, something that she says has been overlooked in past years. Rebecca joins me today to discuss, alongside Anne and Bartha, the director of Epicenter, the European Policy Information Centre. Hello to both of you. Hi, Darren. Good to be here. Now, Rebecca, I want to start by asking you why you felt the burning desire to write a paper on democracy. Great question. I mean, I have been very excited over the last couple of years. I think people have found frustrations with some of the ways in which politics have been going across the West and, and, and more widely. But one, I think one great sort of selfish benefit I've gained from this is I think we we are able, again, to talk about these big issues, whether it's freedom, as indeed we have with the with the Freer Initiative. Mm. And I'm now selfishly going on to another of my obsessions, uh, which is democracy. Now, of course, the sad truth is that these the, 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 the ability to discuss these things, again, comes from, I think, a pressing need. Um, but it's nonetheless exciting all the same. So, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm saying that my reasons are partly selfish, but I'd like to think largely altruistic because I think these things are necessary, not only good to a uh, to organised society. Some people would argue that democracy is valuable for the good things that it brings about, like higher living standards or greater peace, for example. To what extent are you convinced by that argument? I think it's a fair point to say that democratic decision-making procedures help us to achieve more prosperity, help us to achieve more peaceful societies within Europe, but also globally. Um, the democratic peace theory obviously describes that usually democratic, liberal democratic countries don't go to war to one another. But I think um, the benefits of democratic decision-making procedures are instrumental, but not necessarily end goals in themselves. So what I mean by that is that we can have good outcomes through democratic procedures, but it's not a written must. We have many historical examples where democratic decisions led to bad outcomes. Um, so yes, in the majority of the cases, it leads to good results, but we should not take it granted. Rebecca? Yeah, I mean, I think I have a Personally, I think there's a wider, stronger case than just looking at the instrumental um, benefits. And I think this helps someone like me who believes that democracy is something that legitimates um, organised society and has intrinsic value as well as instrumental benefits. It means that I don't have to worry so much about those, those, those bad results that Adam discusses. Now, uh, we can argue all day about what bad is in this, in this context, right? And we probably don't have time to do that. Um, but to my mind, uh, democracy is a necessary part of a good society as well as being something that brings about good ends. But to answer your question directly in terms of some of these instrumental benefits, um, Certainly in my, in my paper, I focus on, on three of these things. Um, so Adam mentioned the democratic th peace theory, which people from Immanuel Kant, Francis Fukuyama have put out. This is this idea in various instantiations that democratic societies are, are more likely to be peaceful, whether that's they're less likely to have a civil war or less likely to go to war with other countries, other democratic nations is the way in which it's usually put. There are other... Um, related ideas that you know they sh they fight shorter wars and that they're more likely to win wars. I mean, obviously, the great irony of this is that this has sometimes led to being what people claim to be a justification for going to war. So if you look at you know George Bush, he's well known for citing this kind of thought. Um, mm. So there's that. Problem with that, obviously, is partly the causal arrow. Is it that peaceful countries are more likely to be democratic, or democratic countries are more likely to be peaceful? Um, I think the standard understanding, I think this guy Dan Reiter has written about it quite a bit, is that this is the closest we get to any kind of formal rule within international relations. So there seems to be a strong case for that. Two, just very briefly, two other instrumental benefits. Um, one, which I'm particularly interested in, I think, is the kind of relationship and independence between, interdependence, sorry, between democracy and other societal goods. So that might be human rights, it might be the rule of law, freedom, justice, equality. Again, all kinds of questions about which way the causal arrow goes. But to my mind, the understanding of democracy I have 
um, is that it entails certain political rights, whether that's the right to life or liberty or political participation. Um, it's dependent on, I think, the rule of law, um, but also w- along with the rule of law can go about to bring about other other good societal ends. So that's one uh, other, other point. And then the third one is, which Adam has also touched upon, is the kind of economic value of democracy. Now, there's been a lot of debate lately mm-hmm. about what kind of um, causal um, sort of proofs we can have for this. It's very, very hard, famously, empirically to prove this. But there have been some interesting studies recently suggesting that flaws in previous approaches to this are missed out points. And particularly if you look at it in a kind of a stock value or a sense of over time, it's hard to prove in a single year that within a democracy mm-hmm. that that leads to economic progress. But over time, there are some very compelling arguments out there that democracy does indeed lead to good economic ends too. And not to mention the B word this early on, but I mean, (laughs) Brexit has shown for some people that predicted economic progress is more important than anything else to some. I mean, what does this tell us about commitment to political rights or freedoms? Yeah, I don't want to be too mean, um, but I think this is a question where you basically also provide the answer. So I think there are very few anti-Brexit free marketeers who would argue that economic benefits um, are above everything else. I think it's a mix of the argument. I think I think a lot of people would say that Brexiteers had three different um, arguments in support for the UK exiting the European Union. The first one was obviously economic prosperity. The goal was to cut back on red tape and increase our global trade. Um, the second one was national sovereignty, so taking back control from elected and unelected EU officials. Mm -hmm. And I think the third point was really convincing the rest of the country by appeasing to them um, on some of the migration issues. Um, And I think so far, uh, these Brexit free market ideas haven't necessarily materialized. Um, How to get out of that conundrum um, is a bit more difficult. Um, because certainly, from a free market perspective, economic benefits are are essential. Um, but it's just the method to get to individual goals and to realize individual um, flourishing, not necessarily the end in themselves. So I think it's a bit like with money. People want to have money so they can realize their own personal goals, but it's just a tool to get there, not the end result in itself. Rebecca? So, yeah, I mean, I've been quite disappointed I think with some of the I mean let, let, yeah let's let's take it in house I mean some of the <laughs> some of the free marketeers I know mm. um have seemed I think um disappointingly keen to trade away core political freedoms for promises of economic progress and we've got to remember that you know predictions are can only ever be predictions um and I found that personally um very depressing so I'd like to paint a more depressing picture of this I think Um, I think part of this comes from an adherence to a kind of consequentialism in which cost-benefit analysis is the only way of looking at this. Um, My personal view, I mean, just briefly to touch on the Brexit point, is I think, um, I don't, I don't, I mean, people people want to blame the Conservative Party for Brexit. The thing on which I would blame the Conservative Party is not so much David Cameron, you know, setting out a manifesto promise to have a referendum or Theresa May's um, approach to negotiations, although believe me, I do have criticisms of of certainly of the latter of those things. Um, my One of my criticisms, I think, is the way in, in which the 2015 election, the strategy was very much our ah, long-term economic plan. This kind of, I think, this idea which they felt, I think, won them the election. Now, we can argue all day about whether that's the case. And personally, I think it's quite an empty way to look at things just in terms of um, in terms of sort of economic ends. But I think that has set the tone for a lot of the Brexit debate. And I find that very depressing, um, partly because I do think that there's intrinsic value to democracy. And indeed, I think it's a necessary part of a legitimate society in terms of the core political freedoms it entails. Um, but I just, I see people all of the time looking as if uh, economic ends are the only thing. You know, democracy is bad because it brings about bad results. Mm. I just find this is a misunderstanding. This is thinking that democracy brings something that brings about certain ends rather than is a mechanism for collaborative decision making, which to my mind um, is a necessary part of organised society because we are free, autonomous creatures who consent to be part of that society. And I think part of the legitimation is that we have a say in the way in which the country is run. Adam, in, the, in a globalised world in 2019, in a you know, hyper globalisation, some would argue, what is the place for democracy and sovereignty? I think there is an essential value in democratic decision making on the local levels. 
I, I think if you're able to reduce the scope of democracy, both in terms of what are the issues that are democratically decided in the political arena, and if you reduce the size of the demos itself, so the people who are voting about these issues, you're going to have better outcomes. So just to take an example, I think individuals who live in a London borough definitely know a lot about the local issues. They know about the, how their hospitals are run. They know what kind of education their children need. They know whether they get them get enough services for the council tax that they're paying. So certainly, I think individuals are very well equipped to vote about local issues that affect them directly. If you talk about big picture stuff like uh, foreign policy or trade negotiations, um, I think the picture changes. Uh, I have a quite a favorite book by Brian Kaplan, um, The Myth of the Rational Voter. And essentially, his argument is that it's rational to remain irrational in political questions. So if you want to invest a lot of time and effort in educating yourself about trade negotiations, you can certainly do that. But the benefits of that well-educated opinion um, is simply not going to outweigh the cost of it. So if you're an amazing piano player and you could earn a lot of money by practicing piano, why the hell would you read up on chlorinated chicken? You just play the piano and then go back home and tweet about chlorinated chicken and create a panic about UK, US trade negotiations. Um, but it's not a given that it's beneficial for you to learn about uh, more distant um, public policy issues. I, I don't want to be described as the sneering elitist <laughs> remainer. Poor, poor piano players. I mean, goodness <laughs> me, Adam, Adam. <laughs> I, I'm sure we can find many public policy issues where I know even less than the Daniel piano Daniel Barenboim players, is, so. a, is, a, is a big voice on politics. Don't always agree with him, but uh, there's definite precedent. For... Um, so so I, I think individual freedom and political rights are not necessarily the same thing. Uh, and and um, free market uh, supporters sometimes... Um, endorse um, individual freedom and negative liberty more, and others emphasize the political rights. So I think it's a legitimate debate, but they are definitely two different things. But I think largely, probably people on our side of the argument are trying to work out maybe what a free society is. That might be might be a starting point that we might be interested in. Um, and one of the things I've been a bit frustrated by, I think, are those people who want to put economic progress over some of those core political rights, maybe because of this epistemic point about who knows the best and who's going to bring about the best results. But I think if you if you trade away some of those political rights um, because you care more about the, the ends of economic progress, it's very, very hard to see where the commitment to any kind of meaningful um, individual freedom is within that. I mean, for instance, you might think, well, the society with the greatest GDP or the society in which we have the greatest preference satisfaction of goods and services um, but you could imagine a society uh, in which those ends come about, which is democratic, and then you could imagine another society in which exactly the same ends come about, but there's no political freedom. Like, say, I don't know, um, everybody who doesn't agree with X is kicked out of the country or someone who's not a net contributor is deported. Um, and yet, yet it still has the same GDP. It may even have higher GDP. We have um, these societies, right? So if you look at Saudi Arabia or Singapore, none of them are great countries from an individual human rights perspective. But uh, economic well-being certainly exists. And, and these are one of the richest societies on earth. I would right. not... But it'd be very, very hard to, to, to reconcile that with some commitment to individual freedom, to suggest that that Definitely. was a good way in which to lead a society. I, so I guess what I'm saying is that unless you recognize political and civil rights... Um, you risk going down the route towards authoritarianism mm -hmm. and therefore to claim any kind of commitment to uh, to individual freedom seems to me to be uh, anachronous, I suppose. I think one of the most vacuous political party slogans I ever read was a democracy that works for everyone. But it, it poses an interesting question. How do we better extend people's participation in democratic deliberation? And now I want you to be quite quick on this. This is the last question. Okay, so Adam. Difficult question, I have to say. Mm. Um, it might not be the best method to do it, but I think political parties and political actors should really stop pandering to their own camp and stop virtue signaling about non-existent disagreements. So I think on the left, a lot of people can be offended about 
on PC speech and not uh, necessarily using the right words. But equally on the right, if you criticize the concept of nation states or if you happen to agree with a European Union politician instead of your own prime minister, then it's considered um, as treason. Um, so I, I think if we just assume good faith on the opposing side, that helps to improve the quality of the debate. And we might realize at the end of the day that, hey, we agree on more things than we would assume. I totally agree. I mean, more clarity, more justification, more politicians telling the truth and not just uh, thinking about their own interests, as all too often we see. Um, uh, yeah. Sorry? <laughs> like asking the leopard to change the spots, isn't it? <laughs> um. Yeah, that's part of the problem. I mean, again, actually, think, going back to the localism point, I think if we, if we had more... Um, more, if there was more scope for decisions to be made at a local level in a way in which we could have an impact, then I think we'd probably see better local politicians coming through. Um, because at the moment, I mean, you just look at something I like to bash on about this, you look at something like fiscal policy, um, the amount of decision making that's made at a local level. I mean, we are an extreme outlier. And I think if, if we gave a bit more power to some local politicians and made them a bit more accountable, then we might see um, people who are more interesting and perhaps are better at clarifying and justifying their ideas. And I think we'd see improve. I agree, completely agree. I mean, it's a completely vacuous statement. Mm. I've literally no idea what it means. Democracy works for everyone. It's like more democracy, better democracy. I mean, we can talk all day about, you know, if a self-contained concept like that can but be improved upon. But we are one upon, of the most but, centralised I mean, economies in the OECD, aren't we? Particularly if you look at fiscal policy. I mean, like what five, I think the OECD says that like 5% of our, our, our tax policy is determined. I actually think it's probably less than that because mm. the grounds on which they determine are things like the sort of autonomy of decision making. Right. And a load of that decision making now actually happens from, from Westminster. So, I mean, personally, I think that's a pretty great place to start. Well, I want you all to get in touch and let us know, is the risk to economic progress worth it for greater individual freedom? Rebecca and Adam, thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks for having us. And for more podcasts, films and reports, visit our website, iea.org.uk. I've been Darren Grimes and I'll be seeing you next week.